Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Kate Brunswick, and I am the AI Ohio Executive Director, here to welcome you to today's program, which is recognizing the added value of research and practice. Um, so this is the first in a series of six workshops uh, AI Ohio is presenting that are focused on practice innovation. Um, they're going to be presented on a weekly basis, and AIA Ohio President Karen Planet expresses her regrets she can't be here today to, to open today's session. She's looking forward to next Tuesday. Uh, I first just want to quickly recognize and thank our 2021 AIA Ohio annual sponsors um, highlighted on the screen right now. Um, these are important partners who have helped us bring programs like this uh, practice innovation series um, to, a, to members of AI Ohio. So we thank them very much. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Um, our program today is scheduled for one and a half hours. Um, it should be through your lunch period. Um, we'll have time for Q&A at the end of the program. If you have questions during the program, um, go ahead and put them in the chat and then we'll address all the questions at the end. Um, please make sure, the obligatory, please make sure your microphone is on mute um, so that all can hear. Um, and toward, uh, toward the end of the presentation, I will be placing a link in the chat box, which you can click to sign up to receive your learning units for today's program. Um, after the program is complete, uh, we will be putting together a white paper of resources from the information that you're gonna to hear today. And we will send that out to participants. Um, I think it's probably gonna go out by email along with an evaluation link. Yes, it's in in yeah. So this is a quick look at our upcoming programs. Uh, this is just really quick, pay special attention to next week's practice innovation workshop, which is Beyond AIA 2030, Reducing Embodied Carbon. Um, if you haven't registered for future workshops, you can do so at AIOhio.org. I've got the full um, link up there. Um, you have to register for each one separately. Um, each session is free. Today's program features two speakers. We have Rachel Foster and Sam Coates from Callison RTKL. Um, and then moderating today is AI Ohio Practice Innovation Committee member, uh, Bill Willoughby. Um, so I am going to thank you all for joining us today and turn it over to Bill. Uh, thank you very much, Kate. Uh, I appreciate it. And I'm gonna share my screen. One moment here on that. Uh, there we go, there we go. So, um, um, I, I, I really appreciate uh, CRTKL for uh, their engagement with this uh, presentation. Uh, um, I'm going to begin it with um, some introduction about research, uh, how, how, how research and practice might, uh, might, um, might add value. Uh, to uh, architectural practice in, in ways that can be accommodated by our, our practice activities. I'm also going to talk a little bit about research and development tax credits that are available. Uh, so you have some idea about the range of research that is possible. Um, uh, Rachel and Sam are going to offer some case studies of research in, in action through practice. Um, and uh, we hope to show uh, places where you can share uh, uh, research. Uh, research is something because it is measurable, because it is applicable, uh, because it is repeatable. Uh, it's something that we should share as, as a profession. Uh, so that's something that we'll talk about as well. We, we'd like some time at the end for questions um, and conversation. Uh, that I think will make this a, uh, I believe, a really exciting uh, session. So I'm glad to be part of these practice innovation workshop uh, series. So with speaker list, I just wanted to 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 list. Uh, um, I won't introduce myself. Uh, I think Kate did a fine enough job with that. But oh, uh, uh, Rachel, um, 
is a member of the AIA. She's also one of the research uh, uh, fellows and a senior designer at uh, Callison RTKL. And uh, uh, Sam Coates is a senior research uh, strategist. He's a core member of the research department uh, leadership team at Callison RT RTKL. So we're very happy to have them uh, here in, in this presentation. Um, we, we have some learning objectives and outcomes for this. Um, you know, we want to define what uh, uh, research is, especially looking at the uh, federal uh, R&D tax credit terminology, because it is possible to seek tax credits for doing research, and also to distinguish research from practice. Um, uh, look at the similarities and the difference between uh, research and, and, and practice itself, to look at some case studies, and also ways we can leverage practice in marketing, in peer recognition, and recruiting uh, talent. Um, so I have a few memes uh, in this. I, I, I like to add these. I teach at the university level. I find that uh, humor uh, makes sure that people pay attention. So uh, one just doesn't uh, simply start conducting research. You kind of have to know what research is. Um, there is a gentleman by the name of uh, Bruce Archer who died in 2005, but he wrote a book called The Nature of Research, and he defines it, I think, really well uh, in the most uh, simplest terms. It's systematic inquiry whose goal is communi communicable knowledge, meaning knowledge that can be shared, and it leads to results that are repeatable and uh, measurable. Now, now, one of the things that I like to do because of design education, we tend to rely on theory. The theory is not equivalent to research. Um, theory does, of course, help us expand frameworks and, and enrich our understanding, but it differs from uh, the agenda of research in a practice. In a certain way, theory, I believe, precedes research because it leads to the question, that leads to the inquiry, that leads to those repeatable and measurable answers. Um, so it's just something that I want to clarify. I think it's a important aspect. There are five characteristics of research that Archer brings up, and I think that these are really important ones. It's systemic and planned, meaning it's orderly and logical, which means that there is the ability to recreate it uh, by following a specific protocol. Um, it's inquiry driven. It's normally about answering questions, which starts with a, with a hypothesis. It's goal oriented, which means that it is purposeful. Um, and normally that leads to experimentation that looks at alternatives and then compares those alternatives to seek better answers. So this is something that we understand as designers quite well. There are parallels between design and practice because we do that as well in our everyday practice. It's knowledge directed and it is a communicable. It's, it is intelligible to a discipline, meaning that it can be shared um, and, 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 and then can be applied in different uh, uh, settings. I think all of us recognize the, um, the, the, the uh, need for uh, greater research uh, in practice, especially when I bring up these terms of uh, performance-informed de de design, evidence-based design. All of us recognize these uh, terms and how they are transforming the way that we practice architecture. Um, but if we think about it, uh, design and the various aspects of architectural practice um, is driven by research on many levels. Um, you know, we can look at it from the application of human behavior, uh, the material and the technological, and even uh, computational tools that we can apply that can create greater efficiencies or the application of greater sense of performance in what we uh, design. So I think these are um, um, important aspects. And I believe um, clients expect firms to be knowledge centers uh, that, that uh, can perform research. Um, um, a design, um, applies research to solve problems. So to understand that, I think we can make a argument that 
a design is enhanced when we apply research skills. All of us understand this, but I just want to recognize that there is a distinction and yet the application of research in practice on an everyday basis. Um, so research is this uh, rigorous investigation, um, typically undertaken to uh, gain original and significant knowledge. And I'll clarify that later on when I talk about uh, tax credits, uh, because I think it is important to understand that a discovery, although that might be the ultimate aim of research, it's not necessarily the standard in which research is done. But I, I, I wanna just be, be clear that not everything creative is research. Um, there needs to be a distinction between research and common everyday practice. And the application of gaining, gaining knowledge, maybe a inventory uh, may not be considered research because it becomes a conventional practice. How do we therefore apply research to possibly improve practice? That could be a research question. So I think that it is important uh, that we understand that, that there is a distinction between practice and research, and, and, and that's probably the most clear one. Um, so, but there are facets uh, that exist within practice um, where innovation, improvements, and new, and new knowledge can be outcomes. So, so a, a couple things, why would we do research? Um, so I just wanna answer that. One, I, I, I would believe that, and, and this could happen in large practices, medium-sized practices and small practices, to essentially improve practice, innovate how you deliver and advance your designs. Um, you can share innovations, uh, which I think is an important reason why, because you can become a knowledge center uh, uh, of this. Uh, a specialist of, of sorts, build a reputation around research, use research uh, expertise to forge partnerships, meaning that your firm does something very specific and has a knowledge base that it can then share and forge partnerships with other offices. Um, uh, site research uh, in, in, in improvements in, to have a uh, edge over the competition. Um, see improvement of work through research. Uh, I think that's another reason um, to build confidence in the work that you do by eliminating uncertainty. Uh, and I would argue also that uh, sophisticated clients understand the value of, of, uh, of a research. Um, uh, I would argue as well at a fundamental level, constant improvement is why we do architecture in the first place. Um, and I would say last is leave a legacy. I think that's a important uh, uh, reason. So, you know, you know, the research is going to be done by itself. So it's important that we, that we, uh, that we do it ourselves. So we should get going is kind of what I'm saying here in this presentation. Um, uh, research is about innovating and improving uh, architectural services. Um, so I want to talk now about research expenses that are incident uh, to the work that we do might be eligible for IRS tax credits. So let me move on here. So, so we might say, well, what? If I do research, it's gonna cost money? Well, there might be tax credits that can be applied over, I believe a 20 year spread that can offset costs of practice. So, so I think that there's some possibilities there. This has been in place uh, since 1981. Uh, it was built on the attempt uh, that uh, there needed to be drivers for global competitiveness uh, of businesses in the United States, uh, specifically looking at um, uh, engineering and sciences uh, in a particular, but to look at R and D and how and how improvements uh, could make us more competitive on a on a on a international a la la level. How the federal government could help uh, with that. So it was extended at the discretion of Congress, but it was made permanent in 2015. So it's meant to incentivize innovation for greater come. Com competitiveness, it can cover wages, uh, supplies, and a support, and here is the kicker, for qualified research activities. 
Um, so, so let me move on and talk and talk about that. Activities um, need only be evolutionary to you, not revolutionary to the industry. So it can can be related to your practice. Um, the tax credits can be applied, can before applied a uh, research. Uh, not just basic research. So this is good for us. It's kind of good for our field since we don't do basic research, but it can be applied. Um, it is effort-based. Um, uh, success does not need to be a sort of expectation, meaning the great uh, discovery that doesn't need to happen, but it's the effort taken. Um, uh, and two thirds of states offer tax credits uh, uh, and the size of your company really doesn't matter. Um, so, there are four criteria, and this is something I do hope Sam and Rachel and myself can talk about kind of relative to architecture as, as a set of professional services. And do we really fit this definition effectively or do we stretch it or are there per particular facets of the architectural uh, profession that can be covered in this way? But it is a good measure for us to look at if, we're, if, we're, if we are defining research and trying to find ways to incentivize it. So the first thing is, is that it might be technological in nature. It tends to fall into the hard sciences like engineering, computer science, the physical uh, sciences. So things like archiving, uh, historical research probably will not count. Um, and I think that there are questions as to whether the social and behavioral research that we might do, the post-occupancy evaluation or questionnaires, whether those would ultimately count. Um, can be done for a, for a permitted purpose. Um, so it's normally to improve something for function, uh, performance, reliability, durability, cost reduction. These are, so it has to be done for a, a permitted purpose. Um, a fundamental characteristic is it has to eliminate uncertainty. Um, and I'll talk about that more as I go on to some of the real R&D expectations that I've researched from the, I, from the I, IRS. One thing I want to clarify is, as I think you saw in my credentials, I'm a university professor. I don't teach accounting. I'm not a uh, accountant. Uh, I do. I I do pay taxes. I understand tax law a bit, like anybody. But so this might be something that you need to consult with your own uh, accountant or tax lawyers to to uh, really get a sense of how can I apply this. How can I Oh, I'll leverage this in, in my practice. The last thing is, is that um, uh, it, uh, whatever you're doing R&D-Y ought to involve experimentation. And I'll talk a little bit about that in these three criteria that are important. These are what the IRS considers tests for R&D tax credits. The discovering of technological information test. So this is what you do doesn't need to be a new a discovery. It does have to eliminate uncertainty to in, inside your business. Um, it can be to obtain knowledge that exceeds or expands or, or re refines that of the skilled professional. So in other words, it has to improve what you are doing as a basis of being a skilled uh, professional. So, so that's, I think that's a really in interesting bar to recognize as a test. Um, the business uh, component is, is it has to be applicable to the profession. It has to be relatable and relevant to the business you are operating. So if it's about better lipstick and you're practicing architecture, you're not into cosmetics, then it may not count uh, in, in, in that way. Um, um, the next part is the process of experimentation, which means that it has to have a rigorous process behind it. Has to, you have to identify uncertainty. You have to look for Im, Im, Im improvements. You have to develop alternatives. And then you have to come up for a, with a process of evaluating those alternatives. So this is what is used as sort of a test in, in that way. So, you know, how do we... How do we make research attractive, uh, recognizable, and something that we um, that we you know 
want to do. So um, I just want to bring up a couple of firms uh, that are kind of uh, mid-sized firms that are, are known for the research that they do. I'd encourage you to look at their uh, sites and, and to see how they are innovating inside of um, the mid-size practices to improve what they do and then sharing that uh, uh, beyond. Um, so Kieran uh, Timberlake, I think, does a really great job. Part of their 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 um, firm uh, mob mission is uh, is a uh, research, and they share that as a form of a practice that is not only doing work but is in inquisitive about improving the craft of of architecture. Um, the other is uh, Gresham Smith. I think that they have a strong uh, mission around innovation and how innovation can key into what they uh, do. So I encourage you to check out their site and to look at um, their kind of insights. These are things that they uh, do that are ways of improving uh, practice. So I encourage you to see that. I would argue that there's a huge, huge evergreen size, you know, research that needs to be done. But if you see the small little tractor there, that little bull bulldozer, I, you know, the, uh, the research being done, I think is smaller than I think that could really be done to improve our profession in a lot of ways. There are funding opportunities. I'll cover those really quick. I don't want to take too much longer on, 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 on this, but there are all uh, opportunities like AIA has the Upjohn Research Initiative um, the Graham Foundation, normally this falls into areas of the humanities related to architecture. Um, the Van Allen uh, is a supportive as well. Um, so the, the last thing I want to talk about is, you know, advancing the profession with research and being able to uh, disseminate that. So, you know, I'd encourage you, you know, if you are conducting research to contribute a white paper you know, attend a research e event, something like EDRA. This is something that Sam and I were just talking about prior to the uh, to the uh, presentation. Um, contribute to a research-based uh, journal. Um, uh, join a council or a committee like the National Institutes of Building Science. Um, uh, AIA does sponsor things like a BRIC. Um, uh, attend a conference or align yourself with university researchers. Um, uh, contribute to an open access journal like uh, like ARCC's Inquiry. Um, again, make these connections with other researchers and other practitioners. I think these are in, in, in important things. And you might find cross-disciplinary research by uh, aligning yourselves with um, allied fields too. So I'll stop there, and and I'm 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 excited to uh, see uh, what Rachel and and Sam uh, have to offer in terms of case studies and even a response to what I just shared. Great. Well, thank you so much for the the background. Um, one minute while I figure out Zoom is is not my native platform here, so let me try to figure out how to share from here. Uh, maybe while we do that, Rachel, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Rachel Foster. I work with Callis and RTKL. I'm an architect in the Chicago office, um, as well as uh, working on some multifamily and, and office buildings. I am a research fellow, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but I get to work with Sam and other members of um, the firm-wide research team and, and bring them closer together with, uh, with some projects day to day. Great, thanks. Um, I'm Sam Coates. I sit in Washington, DC uh, with Callison RTKL um, and my background's in architecture, but um, through, through many different dips and turns, I've found myself in uh, design research and um, I'm just so passionate about this topic and excited to share um, some of both our experiences at Cal and TKL, but just even Rachel and I professionally, some of our experiences with research um, today. So we're going to walk through uh, several case stories that kind of highlight how research looks at CRTKL, um, both from a, you know, a programmatic standpoint, um, but also a, a business standpoint. You know, how is research used um, to better the bottom line of our business? 
by the way, can you can you see my screen okay? Yep. Great. So with that, uh, for those that don't know, uh, Calston RTKL is a, is a global architecture planning and design practice um, that was began over seven decades ago. Um, we really, like many architecture firms, uh, we've really evolved to become more of a, a cultural agency to advance positive outcomes in our communities. Um, this you know, could be anything from a retail mixed use store to um, looking at the brand and customer experience for a large international retailer. Um, and we have 21 uh, offices across the globe. So we're not really here to talk about, about the firm, we're really here to talk about how we approach research. Um, we officially started the research group in uh, late 2019, early 2020, um, an interesting time to start a research department at the start of COVID. But you know, I think what we've seen and maybe many of you have experienced is that research is really helping us to get our hands around uh, the, the kind of crazy and ever-changing world that we live in today. Um, our strategic vision and purpose um, are were kind of our, our first steps, right? What are we here for and what are we gonna do? So our vision is through research to inform radical solutions to the world's most pressing challenges. You know, we wanna be ambitious, audacious, because uh, oftentimes the projects we work on are, are equally matched, right? So we, we have, um, we have a responsibility uh, to, to do our work with, with care and with informed decision. And our purpose is uh, you know, threefold when we started, uh, to elevate the industry standard of research. You know, we're not in it just for ourselves, but we want to um, share what we've learned so that other firms um, and other industries can think about uh, how they want to approach research uh, to broaden knowledge for everyone. Uh, we want to expand the knowledge and skills of our people and our clients. Um, that was kind of a number one priority for our first year in starting is let's meet people where they are and let's build skills of, of you know, not just our team, but of, of every designer, every marketer, every uh, project manager in the firm. And finally, the outcome, really the goal is to build an insights driven organization. How do we take pause uh, on projects, ask the right questions? and really approach a problem with a very informed decision. Like I said, we're gonna talk about um, programs, um, some, some kind of applied research and business strategy. I really see research as an ecosystem that, that is really interconnected with the firm, not a standalone department or, or professionals within the department. Um, so first I'll talk a little bit about programs. The, the programs that we've built are really around our firm and our people and providing pathways for research, um, learning and programs, um, and for people to exercise their curiosity. Um, I think Bill alluded to this earlier, but research is also a really great uh, talent attraction and retainment tool. Um, it's something to keep people curious, <laughs> to keep them sharp, and to um, help people just out of school to continue to, continue to learn and experiment. Through our programs, we'll talk, Rachel will talk a little bit about some specifics, but in general, um, you know, we provide research platforms, we provide, you know, data subscriptions and industry reports for our people to be able to, um, again, start projects off right and start them from a very informed approach. Um, we also do a number of strategic investigations uh, through research projects and grants. Um, we have a number of form, more formalized internal programs uh, as well as learning and skill development opportunities through uh, things like webinars, um, office trainings, but more and more uh, university partnerships, you know, relying on um, the great people out there like Bill and others who are embedded in universities and exposed to, to really great ideas every day. The next is uh, around more the applied research side, which you know, we could call project advisory. So when appropriate, we work with teams on strategic research efforts um, and help them deliver new insights that, that are directly applied onto projects. So what this looks like, you know, in, in some examples, it's a lot of uh, survey design to um, gather qual and quant methods. Um, it's around data access. How do we organize and mine our own project data? How do we um, start to do trend forecasting around, um, again, some of the major disruptions that are happening? And, and for us, we're really focused on people. Um, it's about understanding uh, the demographic and psychographic uh, makeup of the communities that we're designing for. 
And this, this is, I think, where um, different firms' research agendas might, might vary. Some research firm, or sorry, some firms' research efforts are much more um, on material science. Uh, some are much more on, you know, economic impact. Right now, while we do some of that, we're really focused on how do we, how are we impacting people and, and the human experience. And then finally is the kind of business strategy side. So, um, how do we develop new opportunities for the firm, and while also contributing to thought leadership? Um, I think if we think about research on, on, a, on a sliding scale, um, an easy way to start is, is to develop a point of view and use research to do that. Um, if you move on up the ladder in some of the more sophisticated industries, uh, like medicine or law, we're starting to you know, drive policy, drive, drive major decisions through research, but um, this is a great place to start is to develop uh, and contribute to thought leadership. And for us, obviously, that's about articles, conferences, you know, speaking at events like today. Um, it's also around co-publishing or um, finding academic partners to collaborate on research efforts with. You know, it's about helping client teams to um, bolster their project pitches or really bolster um, the, the design team's understanding of their clients' businesses. And then obviously we have um, some client paid research efforts as well. Um, which, which, you know, there's, there's a lot of great examples of that we'll, we'll talk about later. So that's, that's kind of the, the ecosystem that, that we've built out. Um, and I think Rachel, now you're going to talk about, um, some of the programs, uh, first off, uh, which is the fellowship program that we've built. Yeah. So we launched this, uh, CRTKL Research Fellowship. It was launched in 2020. Um, so we're moving into the second year here. Um, the vision really just being to expand the global expertise and, and network of people contributing to research across our firm and um, started with three primary goals um, to share and advocate for the research programs that are going on throughout the office to build a research knowledge base and to drive research awareness at each of our local levels. Um, so moving into the rest of this year and into 2022, the goal is to fo focus more directly on some project advisory roles. Um, there are 10 research advocates. Um, we are spread out across uh, the global firm. So we each have an office or a, uh, a few offices in our region. Um, that So I sit in, in the Chicago office and, and responsible for the Midwest offices. And we are basically advocates and go-betweens for our day-to-day -day project work that we're all a part of. And Sam and other research teams that work more at the firm-wide level, and we can collaborate and, and make sure our respective offices are aware of what's going on firm-wide and, and bring ideas from our offices to the firm-wide approach. So some of our achievements from the first year of the program, um, where we really were just creating, focused on creating a foundation that can build, um, that we can build upon for future years of this program. Um, we started with some social media campaigns, um, research roundtables, and um, three strategic initiatives. Uh, the research roundtables in particular um, were, I think a really successful way for each of us in our respective locations to bring people in directly, get some feedback from them, make people in our offices feel a part of the process of creating what, what the research team was going to focus on and just knowing where things can, can go wrong and how we can improve for the future. Um, so some of those strategic initiatives were um, learning about the value of research at CRTKL and, and we put together some, a bit of a research 101 course for some leaders to be able to get on board with all of the ideas of why research is important and why um, we as a firm should be focusing on it. Um, there were also some idea interviews where we were able to um, get some in-depth information from those doing um, more of the research studies at our firm and be able to, to share that knowledge. 
And then finally, academic partnerships. Um, we created a directory based off of all of the existing relationships that were that people had all over the world um, to keep them in one place so that projects moving forward, they know that if they would like to work with somebody at a university for some research, they know if somebody else in the firm is already working with them, has worked with them in the past. And it's just a way to, to get everybody a little bit more on the same page moving forward. Yeah, and I think while some of these tactics might seem like, oh, that, that's not applicable to me, I don't have a big, a, a big, as big of a firm, I think some of these mindset shifts like uh, learning and like uh, interviewing the people that are doing the research and getting, getting the word out there and just strategically looking at your partnerships and relationships um, are absolutely applicable to, to any size firm. And the next program I'll talk about is our microgrants program, which again, when we set out to start the research department was a fundamental way for us to um, fund all of the great research activities and ideas that are already happening across the firm. Um, I think it's important to, um, you know, kind of humble yourself and understand that there's so much um, great research embedded in projects on a daily basis. And how do we build mechanisms to simply fund or provide um, safe spaces to fail or, or places to experiment within those projects. And so the microgrants was a solution for us to um, fund small research, small, very focused research uh, grant ideas um, for CRTKL staff over, over about a six month period. And so again, the purpose was really to um, develop new knowledge that not only benefits us, but really benefits the industry. You know, we're not keeping this all in house. We're, we're publishing and sharing results and presenting at conferences for, for what we've learned, um, as well as obviously to share with clients. Um, the program is also meant to be a safe spell to ideate, you know, directly implement findings on projects. I think that's really one of the benefits of funding architects, designers to do research while providing them with the resources to do it is that um, we're able to have a, a really close connection with what's going on um, on actual projects in actual markets. And then finally is to really look for the next big idea or frankly, small adjustment that can change the way we do things or the way we think. So, you know, Bill alluded to not every research project needs to be all, all uh, earth shattering. Uh, it, it can be small tweaks that, that move us in the direction we want to go. The culmination of the 2020 program was uh, a first, what's going to be annual research um, journal. This journal really outlined the research questions, approaches, methods, findings, and uh, industry-wide implications for eight uh, projects that we funded. <coughs> um, and this is just a snapshot I'll, I'll um, pass along hopefully to, to Bill and he can share with the group what we uh, had come up with, but the journal really covered um, everything from you know looking at is what bias in the building code exists uh, and they had taken a chapter out of um, the bathroom code for example to look at what the bathroom standards were were for male versus female for example or or temperature in offices um, you know looking at looking at those sorts of foundational things in our industry but also looking at more edge strategies like um, what do we do with decommissioned cruise ships and how can we start to think to uh, turn those into um, uh, low-income residents or, or student housing. So that study was really interesting because it not only looked at the cruise ship industry and looked at the, the sheer um, size of uh, and number of cruise ships being decommissioned, but also did a demographic um, survey uh, or more uh, attitudinal survey of people in Miami, would you want to live here? Uh, so we had a really great mix of asking people, um, you know, doing that kind of public uh, research uh, while also looking at market research. So that's, that's the examples of, I, I think, again, the programs that can be applied at many different scales at many different firms. And now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the more applied research applications um, specifically, and I think Rachel's going to talk about this first one. Yep. So um, one of the microgrant studies that Sam was just talking about was called the future of office work. Very timely topic these days with um, COVID-19 pandemic aftermath. And this one was 
uh, worked on by two people in our London office. So it focuses a little bit on London, but also global implications beyond that. Um, yeah, so the hypothesis that the microgrant study team came up with was that the COVID-19 pandemic changes um, basically are, are here to stay and um, that many of the current office changes due to the pandemic would lead to more permanent changes um, with hybrid model of work being done both at offices and at homes uh, across the world. Um, their approach, uh, the research was um, collected with primary and secondary data collection, and then they analyzed that. Um, primary data is data they collected on their own through um, surveys, observations, and then the secondary data collection was um, more of the literature review and pulling together existing um, research that's already been done on the topic and, and how it can be applied to their hypothesis. Um, so then for their primary data, they created an online survey um, that went out to more than 250 respondents and asking over 30 questions about um, what they thought of their you know, existing and, and future in the workplace. Um, so here are some of those survey results um, the, that really just show that people do want to have a combination of working in office and from home. Um, the offices are not just going to go away completely. Um, in addition, um, something else that was, was found from the surveys was that the youngest age group surveyed the 18 to 25 um, range, they over half of them would rather work at the office full time, um, with many of them citing that they're less likely to know what is expected of them in their offices and, and have that feeling of disconnection from the office culture and, and organizational goals just being earlier on in their careers. So this remote flexible work, um, has been a, the idea of working remotely has been around for a while, but a lot of the barriers to do so um, included trust from employers that the work was going to get done. Um, we um, industries were sort of forced to to trust right away with with the pandemic and and definitely fast track the process. But um, you know most industries are finding that that the, the work is getting done and it's um, not as much of an issue as, as they originally found, um, as well as the technology has just been constantly advancing that to make more of these um, opportunities possible. Um, some other findings were that people still want face-to-face -face time, you know, that the online meetings and, and world of Zoom um, were never gonna be quite enough for them. Um, but that there's things that can be done away from the office, like focused work, um, while more of the social collaborating can be done and wants to be done in the offices. Um, so then knowing those things, how does that adapt both the office space and the city around it? Um, you know, the built environment is going to evolve um, with so many of these central business districts no longer um, receiving people on an everyday basis um, from all over a city, for example. Um, these central business districts have, have reduced demand quite a bit. Um, this also has an effect on lower income service workers who um, worked in the restaurants and cafes and, and shops in these districts that supported the, the office workers that commuted in. Um, and so looking into the future of, of the city planning, it's um, there may be more um, smaller regional hubs of work where um, people can have a little bit more of that 15 minute city idea of getting their, um, having their work, their play, their, you know, restaurants and living all within 15 minutes of them um, and being a little bit more spread out across the city as opposed to one centralized hub. 
Um, so then in conclusion for this microgrant study that was done, um, many people are still exploring the ways of adapting to these post-pandemic circumstances. Um, the findings were that the workplace is, is going to be fluid, more flexible hours and work locations um, adopted by many companies moving forward for good. Um, also very likely that many retail and food and beverage companies will continue um, redistributing locations from um, decreasing decreased demand in, in some of those central business dis districts that I mentioned to more residential locations, and that the city center will be more mixed use um, compared to an office centric approach. So I think that hopefully that helps um, kind of highlight some of the, again, when you work to build platforms that fund existing ideas, right? Um, ideas that we are all grappling with. Uh, I think that's a really great example Rachel just gave of what the outcome or implications for design uh, some, of those, some of those research can yield. Do we wanna just mainly basically touch on, on Ponce and then we can maybe move on to the next one, Rachel, it's up to you. Yeah, I think so. Save, save a little bit of time. Um, we'll just briefly talk about this um, Ponce Bank lab that our customer experience design team focused on, um, which was an opportunity to have a more, um, yeah, rapid approach of design testing and analysis and, and customer feedback to come up with a design delivery as opposed to just basing their design on existing standards. Um, it's you know a lot more opportunity for feedback to fail sooner and cheaply before everything is completed and, and in place. Um, yeah, I think the only thing that's probably worth mentioning here is that um, you know we do a lot of, our, our firm does quite a bit of retail work, but um, the, the kind of cool thing with, again, embedding and imbuing this research mindset into the firm is that we are able to borrow from other industries, you know, an agile approach is not unique to architecture, um, but sometimes this rapid prototyping um, cheaply, as Rachel mentioned, kind of failing fast um, is, is incredibly useful, not only in retail environments, but, but other ones. So this is a great example where um, just an entire team uh, within the firm has really take in this, this research mindset and, and started to say, okay, what does this mean for my industry? What does this mean for my work? Um, maybe we just take a minute to show the video. Is that maybe a good summary? Yeah, I think that's a good explanation okay. of it. So the, the, this was a video that the team had made that kind of talks a little bit about the benefits in the process. So I will just play this. The thing that I feel is most beneficial about the Ponce Bank Lab overall and in the long term is the ability to bring everybody here that works in various branches and instill in them a sense that they have an empowerment to be able to contribute to the ongoing improvement of our customer service. We weren't sure what to expect going in and doing this in a bank, which is a very traditional kind of business. And there's also special uh, issues around uh, banking, like privacy, for example, or security. Um, but we've made, been able to deal with that, and I think the customers have been responding extremely well. If you take a look over at our feedback wall, the impressions are extremely positive, and we're getting notes all through the space on all the tables and things that are also really helpful. Staff have been exceptionally engaged with this and being able to sort of push on their own service model that they're going to be putting in place is something that's a great opportunity for them to really feel like they're part of the process because really they're driving it. It's actually not coming from us. All the best ideas are coming from the group as a whole and we're just creating a platform to be able to filter them up to the best ones. The concept of being open to have that personal touch with the client to that the, when the client come in to welcome them to conduct the transaction from the beginning to the end they really posit it and they're really happy about the change we're really a strong part of each of our communities um, we do 
community events, we might have like chamber of commerce meetings in our branches, and we're actually trying to redesign the branches to include community space so that uh, we can continue to strengthen the bond with our community. So yeah, hopefully that um, kind of gives you a snapshot of uh, what the, the process was for that project and maybe uh, helps to spark some ideas of how you can um, think about, you know, your projects as, as test beds and, and places to do rapid prototyping. So I'm going to move on to the last section here before we open it up for, for questions or comments. Um, and this is really speaking to the value of research in, in your business strategy. Um, you know, research can really go beyond just funding grants. It can also be an, in, an integral part of the way you do business. Um, as an example for us, um, we really wanted to, and again, one of our goals for starting this, this group in the last year was to build the research skills of all our staff um, to better inform the design approach. Um, and when I say all, I do mean all. So it's not just the designers and architects, it's also the, uh, the accountants, the people running the projects. Um, and in this case, it was about working with the marketing staff so um, the research team worked to develop a training module for marketing staff to be a, better be able to conduct um, industry uh, and market trends uh, within, the, within their sectors. So, you know, why, why did we do this? <laughs> we really saw an opportunity. Um, what we saw was, you know, regions, design leaders, and project teams were consistently coming to uh, the research team and asking, uh, what's the future of travel in Canada and how are hotels responding to that? You know, frankly, these hyper, hyper specific um, questions that um, would, would take quite a bit for, for, for me to answer because I don't design hotels and I, I don't live in Canada. <laughs> so um, I think it was just about upskilling people um, so that they could, they could understand how they could start to answer these questions for themselves and for their project teams. Um, and really the importance of this is, especially um, during COVID when we had, had done this, we were trying to get our arms around answering some of these questions to be able to um, not future proof, but future ready projects for our clients. And so the solution for us was to, again, build a set of um, training modules to be able to uh, identify, target and apply these trends uh, to the future of our design team's work. Um, and we recognized really early on that the primary focus um, of trend mapping uh, was to, to touch a little bit on application. So we conducted a survey ahead of the training with the marketing staff, and we knew that they were, you know, that if we think about it on a spectrum, they were watching and scanning for trends. You know, they were passively reading headlines and news articles. They were subscribing and, and reading all the, all the correct periodicals. But what we weren't doing as good a job of was the mapping and application. So, you know, the mapping is defining a research question and really seeking out um, trends and data from multiple sources. So either validating or discrediting that, that trend, for example, um, and then taking those learnings and applying them. So really collecting the trends and data, summarizing them into key findings. And this is the key point, actionable insights or actionable solutions. Um, and that's really where the, the kind of critical handoff with the design team is. Um, in addition to the, the training, you know, the upskills, we also talked about a change in behavior. Uh, as we all know, um, it's not just enough to, to teach people to fish. We've also got to change, change behaviors uh, or, or change hearts and minds. And, um, you know, we did this by talking about the fact that it was really important for, for marketing and design teams to become daily readers um, setting up, you know, Twitter, Google, whatever alerts, um, feeds that would give people the latest industry trends. And also um, for them to become, uh, you know, competitor watchers. Um, what are other people saying about that industry? What are other people sharing? And what are their research groups, for example, writing about? And then finally, getting out there and observing, um, you know, what's going on in, in the, that city? What are the people doing? Um, what are the people eating and, and what are they using? So beyond just the kind of uh, glossy uh, market reports and research papers, um, what are people saying on Instagram or Twitter? These are all um, now in this kind of new digital 
uh, world, their new data sources that we need to be um, that we need to be considering as very important. So, as an example uh, of how this trend mapping skill really resulted in something, um, the marketing team uh, led a rules to break in retail trend trend project, which was essentially a deck um, for our retail group to say, here are the things that we can start to to they might be norms in the retail environment, but we could start to say, we should probably move away from that norm based on some of the trend mapping we've been doing. So what was kind of cool is the, the research, or sorry, the marketing group really worked with us, the research team and the practice area leaders um, to develop a point of view around, around the future of retail. And the outcome was a really well-rounded uh, research informed market specific point of view to, to go and talk with clients about. And I won't go into a lot of detail, but um, you know, from a from a kind of more research or or demographic standpoint, it really uh, understood and took into account the consumer spending habits and the demographic shifts that were happening in each generation, for example. Um, and and that's how we started to really develop a point of view around. Okay, if we see that um, Gen X is is spending. Um, you know, less than, than baby boomers, maybe that shifts who we should be focusing on or who we should be designing for uh, in the next 5, 10, 15 years, and not just assuming whatever the, the, the client is, is saying is, is maybe um, the best solution. And then finally, you know, with, with all of this work, we kind of landed on some, some rules to break. You know, for example, um, um, create intentional friction points, you know, in retail, it doesn't always have to be frictionless. There could be some moments of pause and reflection. So it, again, it's just kind of taking these, um, maybe these decks that we see all the time around, around design principles, but really backing them up with some data and insight. So um, that was probably a lot to throw at you all, but uh, thank you for hanging on with us. And, um, you know, there's our emails in case you want to reach out to us directly. But I think, uh, Bill, we were going to have maybe a discussion or, or I'm not sure what you wanted to do next. So uh, what I thought we would do is um, I have some questions uh, for you and Rachel. Um, and I thought I would maybe ask some of those. And that might take about 10 minutes. And then we would open it up to questions for uh, any of our um, our uh, 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 uh uh, uh, participants so that they can have uh, input there as well. Um, let me see right now. Great, 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 great. So I thought I, I would share those. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, just one uh, moment, please. Um, uh, and I'll be with you. So I have someone at my door. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Uh, you know, just to, to, to fill this moment, I think um, if there's any questions, we are also happy to answer them in the chat um, or, or ideas, you know, things that you struggle with, things that you find um, as an opportunity when research, but. So, uh, yeah, oh, wait, oh, wait, Sam, did you ask a question of uh, Rachel? No, I, I was just saying that if people, uh, you know, had questions or comments to enter them in the chat as, as we're going along. Great, great. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, essentially, one of my questions is, and, and this kind of came up, um, you know, knowing that uh, your more uh, organized uh, research efforts have been happening over the, over the last two years, I'm wondering um, what was the process that you went about uh, determining your vision and your uh, mission? Of course, I understand like a, like a strategic uh, planning process, but I was wondering what, what actually led uh, CRTKL to to really begin to map this out, um, who were the uh, stakeholders who uh, came in and uh, kind of uh, really worked on crafting, I think, a very elegant uh, mission and vision that then has uh, driven into these initiatives that you have run throughout the practice. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. And you know, what's what's the what's the uh, starting point really? And um, much of the work happened before I started. Frankly, I, oddly enough, I started like day one of, of COVID, so 2020-ish. Um, but previous to this, I was at uh, Gensler with their research uh, institute that's been around for about 12 years now. Um, and I, 
and I think before, you know, before I started, uh, my colleague, Sarah Wicker, who's the director of research, um, was really, uh, you know, started, started this group in earnest based on some feedback that had been given from the C-suite and other um, firm leaders for multiple years, right? It was always like, we need to, we need to be doing more around research. We need to be um, investigating our projects more. We need to do X, Y, Z. And I think it got to the tipping point where, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't ignore that request or that, that demand from project teams any longer. And um, the CEO at the time um, just made a, made a strategic investment, right? To hire, hire and start a research department. And so I think to your question, Bill, the stakeholders was, it, it feels like, and, and this could be wrong, but it feels like it was driven from the bottom up. And I think um, for project teams to understand and see the value in research is really great, um, but that also has to be matched with willingness um, and strategic uh, investment, obviously, uh, by, by the C-suite and by the firm. So I think it's a, it's a both and. Well, that, that is a really interesting to hear. I, I think that it, it, it sort of uh, most definitely points to uh, this notion that uh, to recruit and to retain talent might be to seed that continuous inquiry uh, that research can uh, I'll, I'll, I'll lead to. Um, so that, that leads me to um, the next question, which is kind of what you showed in your case studies. Um, when projects are initiated, and I'm particularly interested in the uh, Ponce Bank Lab, um, uh, is research um, an immediate consideration? Uh, kind of, is it this upfront goal? Is it maybe something that, when conversations with clients happen, that one says, "Hey, we could do this," it, you know, uh, or is it something that happens along the way? Is it is it as the project of uh, 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 progresses that there's a discovery of an important question. Um, and does that question uh, uh, kind of uh, need a discovering in order for the project to advance? If you see my question and kind of yeah. where I'm taking yeah. it, is it an upfront goal or is it something that happens kind of on the make? <laughs> I mean, I think uh, it's a, a lot of the above. Um, a, oftentimes there's, you know, moments later on in a project where it becomes necessary. And I think the more that people interact with, you know, rapid prototyping, for example, and like getting that immediate feedback, the more likely they are to want to start with that. You know, it, it has to kind of start from within, um, similar to the start of the research program and get that, that buy-in um, from people to really be able to stick around as opposed to just like, we must start with this research, check the box and move on. You know, it's a lot of it comes naturally in projects. And then now that um, customer experience design group in our firm, for example, is doing it in most projects, I think. Um, and it's just started out maybe in, in a project like Ponce Bank. And now they can go and, and share that with future clients and say like, this worked really well. And maybe that came about organically as opposed to like them going into that project, knowing that they're gonna do it. But now, you know, the more you do it, the more you have um, information on, on what worked and what didn't and want to try it again and, and improve on it. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, Rachel, which is um, it is going to take some likely some capital investment on the firm's part because most clients don't want to be experimented on. <laughs> most clients want to know that it's going to work. And so if it naturally comes up in a project and you can say, ding, I recognize that. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to track the process that we went through and I'm going to document it. And I'm going to take the time to develop the case story around it. And then that becomes your, your proof point, right? That you can go to other clients and you can lead with the research and, and not just say, oh, it might pop up. You're able to say, no, we did this on a project and here's how it worked. And this is how we want to start your project. And uh, this is how we're going to, to um, cover our fee for it, which, which is a whole other uh, thing. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a really interesting point. The 
uh, Ponce Bank was, I mean, I think that's a really interesting way of doing uh, marketing research and really seeking innovation, um, you know, and, and then finding a way to then apply that uh, to later projects is I think uh, it, it begins to talk about that model of driving, not just innovation in the final building, but in how we, how we actually uh, deliver our architectural services. So I think that's, that's quite interesting. My, 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 my next question is something because I do teach design studios and as a design studio instructor, I try to weigh the, pra the pragmatic and the practical with the aspirational and the creative. Um, you know, uh, but one of the things that when I teach research, it's more about building a inventory, uh, a, 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 a set of data points that can then be applied in design. And, and that is, you know, that kind of, uh, kind of uh, archival research, uh, you know, seeking web, these are important skills so that you can gain a, kind of a, a sense of the terrain but the research skills that become applied about developing a hypothesis, figuring out an experimental method that can be a verifiable, uh, finding a, a methodology to compare, those are different research skills. And so one of my questions is, should research skills along those lines be taught in universities and incorporated into design education as a expectation of of aptitude for professional architects? Uh, and I think this is a, a question because it could drive change in the profession and I think make, um, make a, a, a sort of a, a community of architects that anticipate that. I, I wonder what your thoughts might be on that as sort of a, uh, just a, a, a loaded question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, and, and I'm biased, you know, I, I spend most of my time in, in the field of research, but I'm also a total kind of strategist at heart. And so um, while I did study architecture uh, and went to architecture school and, and worked as a designer for many years, um, I felt that I went through a period of time for just me personally, professionally, I didn't have a space within architecture. And, and that's not a great feeling to have. So I think beyond even just, I do think we should be teaching these skills, but we as, a, as professionals need to create space for this as a career opportunity. Um, you don't just have to follow one track. I think uh, it's very obvious that um, other professions are now seeing design as valuable. And so, um, which is great, but now we're having to compete with those, with those salaries of, of other professions that can, that can maybe pay a little bit more. So, um, I think it's about teaching those skills. I think it's about humbling ourselves to, to know when we've kind of hit the end of our understanding um, and being willing to invite others into, into the party and um, you know, hiring uh, data scientists and collaborating with people from different fields. And you know, much like architects and designers are, are um, kind of master, um, master uh, you know, organizers of, of, our, of our clients and our consultants, we should be doing the same within our profession. And I think Rachel kind of talked when we were talking about this, talked about your, your experience in school and even kind of how some of, some of these things are happening. I think some of the skills are being built. Yeah, I mean, in, a, in my master's program, for example, what, there was definitely you know, touch on, on research and some of the coursework and then obviously in putting together a thesis. So some of the skill sets are there. And I think like Sam mentioned, it's knowing in school that this could be a pathway for architecture students that, that feel more passionately or are more successful at that than, than other parts of architecture. I feel like in school, I remember hearing a lot like, oh, you can do so much with an architecture degree. And I was like, okay, what, what are those things? Like, let's, let's be clear about what those pathways are and, and give people examples of, of where that can take them and finding, you know, somebody it likes and enjoys architecture, but they are a really strong writer, knowing that there's a place for them in the industry versus like only the one type of architect. Great. Um, I, I guess 
my next general question is dealing with uh, something that I brought up in my talk. And Sam, I think early on we had a conversation about, which is, are there uh, limitations? I mean, kind of knowing that there are tax credits available, um, are there uh, limitations or innate uh, biases built into the tax code um, that might uh, orient research in architecture uh, away from certain things like, you know, like things that would be easily accepted by the tax code might be kind of the material science side, looking at building energy performance, that these would be things that really fit into that kind of technology engineering uh, benchmark uh, and sort of working against things that are more like the social behavioral that seem that you at uh, Callison RTKL are, are really kind of, you know, organizing your, uh, your very client oriented, people oriented uh, around. So, so, I mean, are there things we should do to resist that? Or are there strategies whereby which we can uh, leverage that as a profession? Yeah, I mean, um, so we actually, uh, you know, went through the process of working with our um, uh, tax consultants to understand what of our what of our hours or efforts as a research department apply? And surprisingly, it wasn't as much as we had hoped for or thought. And I think, you know, I pulled out one example from a, from the uh, one of the tests that you talked about, Bill, which was, um, is it technological in nature? And the way they talk about it is the activity performed must fundamentally rely on principles of physical or biological science, uh, engineering, or computer science. And so, um, while some of our work does do that, um, much of a, around social psychology and, and better understanding the way humans interact in space does not, which um, I think is unfortunate. Um, so I think that's maybe one space where uh, we as an industry can have a, have a voice to, to help evolve. But on the plus side, I think that a lot of the, a lot of the building technology, a lot of the, um, you know, computer digital design, um, you know, computational design work um, seems to much, and, and sustainability seems to much more align with that um, tax credit. So a lot of the work you are doing on projects already, if you if you kind of uh, maybe reformat it or, or go back and, and um, consider it in that lens, it could be very applicable and might not even require, you know, starting a dedicated research environment. Great, great. I, I have one last question before we go to what will be in the chat. Um, uh, and uh, so what that question is, um, are there, and I think Sam, you actually touched on this, are there areas that we as a profession um, should be conducting research in? Obviously, you know, um, you know uh, sustainability uh, is one of those that, and that could be shared uh, profession-wise. Or, or, I mean, it, it would be an interesting conversation to have, like a brainstorming uh, a session to really look at the future trends and say, here are the areas that we as a profession can have the greatest impact um, on the scope of services that we offer and, and really look at that and say, these are the areas where we as a field ought to be doing research. I, I would assume that is being done, um, you know, but um, it would be interesting to actually know that. I, I don't know, what are your thoughts on, 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 on that? How, how, would we, how would we make that happen? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a lot of topics that, that can be researched upon, like you've mentioned. Um, I think something that I'm I'm seeing a lot more of recently is is some of that affordability and and equitable design approach and and like Sam mentioned earlier thinking more about our implications on the communities that we build in and thinking more long term on on what what happens after after that project is built that building is done and and we leave what what are all of the implications of that and and thinking more of a prof as a profession on on our impact in those areas yeah yeah that's a i think that's a really really good point all of us i would hope agree in equity and and the diversity but when it comes to the question of how do we apply those 
how do, how is that really become instrumental in our fields, um, you know, becomes, a, I think, a, a huge, huge question that I think could offer a greater research uh, as, as well. So, so I think there are definitely areas that, you know, we as a profession could begin to uh, begin to lay out, even though that might extend beyond, uh, uh, you know, research and development uh, definition. Okay. I think one of the other areas that, um, you know, selfishly, I think we also need to start thinking about the research model and design firms as um, somewhat self-sustaining. Uh, as, as economies become much more volatile, as you know, economic shifts happen, um, things like research are, are sometimes seen as superfluous and, and get cut. And um, I think the, one of the critical things of research is that it's a long-term view on a, on a problem and, and solution. Um, and to have short-sighted uh, you know, monetary uh, outlooks on it is unfortunate. So to overcome that, I think, I think one of the things a value add that research can offer and a topic that we need to be doing more research on is how to better collect um, both the design, um, but also ongoing performance data of our buildings. Um, I think this is kind of a treasure trove that um, companies like Google, uh, when they bought out Nest, for example, um, are really starting to see the value of having devices <laughs> in spaces that continuously flow data and exhaust data um, is, is hugely valuable. And I think as no one firm can do this, and, and this would really take the consortium of, of many, many firms um, and the AIA, but um, how can we as an industry better track, share, and, and, and then mine that data to, to be able to not predict, but point to outcomes in the built environment in the future. Um, I think that's a huge area of study um, and kind of missed opportunity right now. A really, really good point. Um, one of uh, our participants raises a really interesting question about areas, which is looking at climate mi migration. I, I, as a practitioner, I've noticed this as well, that the buildings I designed in certain regions in the past uh, don't really fit the climactic and weather conditions of the present. And how do we begin to look at climate migration, especially as, as the comment makes, areas are becoming uh, more uh, uninhabitable um, or how we live in that area with, with the climate shift, do we build in a different ways? Um, I'm not sure if in Chicago you're experiencing uh, greater and more intense rain events, but we in uh, Ohio are, I would say, um, but other areas are experiencing drought. Um, so here, I will get into some uh, some of the questions. We have some really good ones here. Um, on a specific uh, question, uh, dealing with the microgrants, um, um, are they, they are set up for uh, CALIS and RTKL research projects. And then the question is, you know, uh, do they approve the project? Uh, and, and then the fees for that work, are they billed against the grant? Um, I, you know, it sort of was brought that uh, this works well for the office uh, space uh, project. And um, uh, uh, so, so, so that is the question. And was the uh, case bank a study, was, was that maybe used as a tax credit project? Um, yeah, so maybe some some behind the scenes on those projects is the the bank project was a client pursuit. Excuse me, it was a client project, not a not a research project, which was you know taking taking the principles of of uh, testing and, and other research methods and applying it directly to a project for fee, which is the 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 golden egg, right? Um, but for micro grants, the way we set that up is it's a capital investment by the firm. So we give, uh, we, we open it up for uh, people to submit their ideas. We have a review committee, um, both the research leadership, but also the, the C-suite leadership uh, evaluate and rank those ideas and, and select a certain number to fund. Um, and that funding is basically, um, a project number to build towards. It's not, it's not built, none of that is built to the client. So it's taking, you could think about it as taking a marketing budget number and applying it for a specific research grant um, program. And the, the cool thing about that is that 
we're operating outside the um, guardrails of a, a, pro a project or, or a client um, pursuit. And so I think it frees, it, it frees teams up to really research what they want to and what they think is going to be most beneficial um, without having to satisfy any, any client brief. Um, so yeah, hopefully that kind of helps, helps that. And then for the tax credit, you know, it's frankly, it's something we're still a little new about and we're learning as well. So um, it, we, we don't have it figured out and it, I think it's good to just um, test and, and submit maybe in multiple categories every year and see what, what happens and what doesn't and, and building your strategy around that. It, it actually may be something we as a, we, uh, we as a profession need to lobby, uh, you know, at the federal uh, level, and maybe at the state, uh, if, if states, because there are some states that have R&D tax credits that can expand that uh, definition because, you know, yeah, I, I, I could see that being the case. This is, I think, really uh, next uh, question here, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty a, a practical one, but uh, do you share the microgrant brochure beyond the confines of your office? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. is it available on your uh, website or something like that? It is. It is. And that's, that's great. I, maybe it's the nature of like, who's in our research group. Um, we try to, you know, this is investment by the firm. We get a lot of benefit out of it, but we try to be as open as humanly possible with, with everyone and share, share what we learn because um, you know, we're all going to benefit from knowing more. So yeah, most, most everything we do, we try to, yeah, thanks for posting. Um, we try to um, share. I think that's great. I mean, I think that's one of the key aspects of um, uh, research is how do we, you know, raise the water level because that, 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 you know, you've heard the adage, it raises all boats, you know, uh, and I think that that is a important thing to recognize uh, in this endeavor. And obviously there are benefits. Um, I'm thinking of the, uh, of the Ponce Bank project the client may not have come to you, come come to you without the the research acumen and the mechanisms in place to make that project possible. Uh, they may have looked at another firm that that had had the competitive edge on that, but but you were able to take your marketing a uh, department and really kind of capitalize on that and then uh, develop a strategy because you had also the research leadership uh, department, you know, in, 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 in place too. having those parts and being able to put them into action, I think is, uh, is uh, quite good. The other thing I'll, I'll, that's worth mentioning kind of on the being open as possible is that um, we hosted what, what we call a collab, which is a, a really short um, focused virtual sprint around a specific question or topic. Uh, we did one uh, over the summer around um, the circular economy of, of retail waste. You know, so when, when we deconstruct a retail store, what happens to all that and how can we better um, circulate that back into use? And so uh, over, I guess it was last, last month, two months ago, um, time's all melding together now, we co-hosted another collab event with the AIA around, and this is, I think, how we got linked up with Bill, which is um, how do we better link practice to academia to um, do more research together? And so that was the central question. And actually just today on our website, we, we just shared the report or the results of that collab. But um, I think I would just urge more firms to, to do more of that, at, you know, even at the local level is um, just re reach across the aisle, if you will, you know, reach across industries um, because, you know, we're not going to, for example, uh, Rachel was talking earlier, we're not going to achieve the, the 2030, you know, goals um, if we're just doing it all in isolation. Great. I, I really appreciate that. I, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have one last call for any, any additional <coughs> questions. We're, we're kind of getting close to time. Um, I do want to, though, thank uh, uh, Melinda uh, Scalfaro, who uh, is the uh, chairing the committee for these practice in a innovation uh, um, learning opportunities. Uh, and I also want to encourage you all to 
uh, join in next Tuesday. I think we have a great round of uh, presentations uh, uh, that we have been uh, working on. Uh, and I think you'll find them to hopefully charge your practice. So I'll, I'll going once, going twice. <laughs> With my stuttering, I would be a lousy, uh, what do you call that? A, um, a, uh, a, a auctioneer. auctioneer. Yeah, I would be a terrible <laughs> auctioneer. They really need to talk wins. fast. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rachel, Sam. Uh, thank you so much for your, for your, for your insights, uh, your contributions to this. I think this was a great learning opportunity. Um, so we appreciate it a whole lot. Hopefully we'll see some of these audience members uh, next week. And and uh, Rachel and Sam, uh, these are free. So you can join on in too. Feel free to sign up if you find a topic that you find interesting. Would love to have you back. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for having us. And really appreciate the time and effort and attention and investment that you put into this. Of course, thank Happy you. To. All right, bye-bye. Thank sure. you. All right. See you.